So our study today begins with uh, the readings for this coming Sunday, which is the 18th Sunday after Pentecost, or uh, variously in the Revised Common Lectionary, it, they are the lessons for uh, cycle A, proper 21, and we are on track two or the complementary readings as they are known. But the gospel lesson, which is what the cycle of the lectionary is based on, is, are the, is the Matthew cycle, as we're still in the year of Matthew. But we are getting toward the end of Matthew's gospel, which means basically we're getting to that point where we're getting closer and closer to that section of the uh, gospel, which we know as the Passion Narrative, which, of course, we don't read uh, as the year comes to a close, we read that at uh, Easter time uh, with Holy Week and Passion Sunday. So this most recent Passion Sunday that we had, or uh, Palm Sunday, we read from Matthew's uh, version of the Passion. Uh, but this is, we are sort of inching up to that particular element. So the context, the setting, is Jesus now making his way to Jerusalem. So this is the ending period of Jesus' ministry um, in the Holy Land. So th that's we got to kind of keep that in mind as we read the narrative and have we understand the dialogue that's happening. That has a lot of uh, influence on how we interpret what's happening and the arguments that are being had relative to uh, what's going on. But we'll begin first, um, because this is the, um, we are using in our liturgy at St. Luke's this track two, which is available to us in the Revised Common Lectionary, the complementary uh, lessons. Uh, that has to do with which of the Old Testament lessons are chosen. Uh, we will be reading from, um, from the prophet Ezekiel, which we've been reading from regularly over the last couple of Sundays. So let's uh, bring the, the um, lessons up on the screen. There we go. So now what we have are the is the... Um, Prophecy of Ezekiel from the 18th chapter. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating the proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lives are mine. The life of the parent as well as the life of the child is mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is unfair. Hear now, O house of Israel. Is my way unfair? Is it not your way that ways that are unfair? When the righteous turn away from their righteousness and commit iniquity, they shall die for it. For the iniquity that they have committed, they shall die. Again, when the wicked turn away from the wickedness they have committed and do what is lawful and right, they shall save their life because they considered and turned away from the, all the tr transgressions that they had committed, they shall surely live, they shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is unfair. O house of Israel, are my ways unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? <laughs> Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, all of you according to your ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions. Otherwise, iniquity will be your ruin. <laughs> Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed against me and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? 
for I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. Turn then and live. Here ends the lesson. And this is a the complement to the gospel lesson. So we'll go directly to that and then we'll turn back to the epistle for kind of a selfish reason. But we'll do the gospel first. From Matthew's 21st chapter. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? And Jesus said to them, I also will ask you one question. And if you answer, if you tell me the answer, then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? And so they argued with one another. Why, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, then why did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, then we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a great prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, then neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and he went. The father went to the second and said the same. He answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. <laughs> now, which of the two did the will of his father? And they said, why the first? <coughs> Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. Here ends the lesson. Oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, he really um, got them and, uh, <laughs> and left them speechless. Uh, but I'm impressed by Ezekiel mm -hmm. and how far back that was. And he was preaching a, a basic, a fundamental aspect of, of our relationship with God and each other uh -huh. and now uh, many 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 years later we're still arguing over it uh -huh. and um, that is the people who know it all uh -huh. uh, and they're the ones that are the worst transgressors because uh, they should know and the answer should have been easy for them but they would have to admit that they were wrong uh, back wow. down the line. See? And we know today that that's still a difficult thing for anybody yes. to do. Yes. yes. And he has capitalized on that. There's something about that that seems to be baked in to the human heart, isn't it? You know, where... It, and we can take it out of religious practice and even think about our family life. How hard is it, for example, for parents to admit to their children sometimes that they may have been wrong about something? You know, when the kids turn around and they say, well, you said this, but, you know, and it's just plain as the nose on their face. Well, go to your room anyway. You know, you know, it's, it's it, you know, it's that kind of thing, where even if they sort of relent a little bit in their peak or their anger, they still just can't say, "Well, I'm sorry, I was wrong." Admitting 
that we might be wrong, particularly when we are in, and we'll put this in air quotes, in authority yeah. is one of those most difficult things. I only learned how to say I was wrong after I got married. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and it gets easier as time goes on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, it's interesting, you know, uh, being a teacher, you know, in a graduate school, you know, when a, when a student catches you on something, um, Kathy's seen this, you know, in the Stevenson school, there are times that, I, you know, a, a student will catch me. I mean, she's done it to me, uh, you know, well, you know, well, I look this up and I'm like, hmm, you know, you may be right, you know, and it's just to be able to say, I'll have to go check on that. You know, or I have repeated something so often that I have, I heard it someplace or I read it someplace. And sometimes, you know, you, particularly when you teach something over and over and over and over again, and you fail to double check yourself because you just have taught it so many times that you just, you don't bother rereading an article or, you know, and suddenly somebody reads it for the first time and they read it with fresh eyes and maybe you've misinterpreted it or you've, you know, you, 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 you stated it slightly wrong once and it got slightly, slightly more wrong and slightly more wrong and it's slightly more wrong, you know, and suddenly it's completely erroneous. And then somebody actually corrects you altogether. You know, who's a great one for that? Francis Kisner. <laughs> oh yeah, I can imagine. Because <laughs> he's such a, uh, you know, he's a very, you know, because his his background and so on is, you know, he's just a naturally curious person. And um, the other day, you know, well, I, when I was preaching a couple of weeks ago, and I talked about the value of a denarius and the value of a talent, he actually went to look it up, and. Um, while I wasn't wrong relative to my conceptualization of proportion, that one was grossly more valuable than the other, the specifics, I was off on the specifics. And I was grateful that he had done it because I had read this like years, so many years ago that I had just, I, I knew that, you know, it was the proportion that I was really trying to make the, the, the point about. And so the detail, you know, I just got sloppy, to be honest. And I had to admit it that I got sloppy. A you year's know. wages versus, versus a month's wages. Yeah, well, it was actually more so. Actually, <laughs> what, what he what he discovered was it even was even more so. So, you know, it it, it it was even a bigger proportion. I mean, that was bad enough, you know, but but the point was being the point was at least still correct. So I didn't preach something that was wrong, but the granular analysis was erroneous. So, you know, the detail in, with the, in the detail. So I, I could at least stand in the, um, in, in, in the position of saying, I was correct in my analysis that this notion of how much forgiveness, you know, was necessary. That was still correct, but you know, now I have to go back and re retool my my ruler, as it were. And you know, him teaching physics, you know, so measurements are really, really important to him. So I have to go back and re retool that. So you know, if I'm still preaching, you know, the <laughs> next time that comes around, I'm going to make sure that I'm correct. So, you know, those, those kinds of things. But the point being, I forgot what the point I was going to make, but the issue, oh, I know, saying that we're, we're wrong is, you know, when we're in a position of authority, what is going on? Okay, let me stop. I'm going to turn this notifications off here. Um, when things 
when we are in positions of authority, whether it's teaching, whether it's parenting, um, it's very hard to admit we're wrong. And very often it can have life-threatening, you know, George, you were in medicine, you know, I can, cannot imagine sometimes, you know, people with the God concept, sometimes yeah. you've probably yeah. run into that, particularly at the med center, you know, where people say, I know what I'm talking about and don't tell me I'm wrong, you know, because a, a nurse and, trying to tell a doctor, you know. <laughs> the, yeah. um, we are fortunate when we have a person like that, that will gently tell us that uh, we were not very accurate or we were, and we had somehow or other missed the target. And so that you were lucky that we had a person who, I remember the, your sermon very well. And I, I was impressed that you knew the the relationship between one and the other. I didn't even know that much about it, yeah. <laughs> except one was bigger than the other. And and here he, he gently um, puts it back into perspective. So the next time you use that in a sermon, <laughs> you'll say it a little bit differently. <laughs> well, well, but I want to point something out that you just said. You, you used the phrase, miss the target. <laughs> That is actually, when we talk about sin, the Greek word for sin is harmartia. And that's what harmartia means. Missing the target. It's an arch, it's like an archery term. Yeah. Where we didn't hit the bullseye. It went, we went astray. And often that's what we talk about sin, that we went astray. And so this notion that we weren't on target. So, you know, I mean, and I just bring that in because that's an interesting turn of phrase because we're going to talk in a moment again about another Greek term, which is also related to all of this relative to this notion of authority, because that's what's, that's what's going on here. The, the 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 leaders the religious leaders are questioning Jesus authority how can you say these things on whose authority are you saying these things Kathy you've been scribbling and think what are you thinking about here you studied Matthew's, <laughs> well, <laughs> studied Matthew's gospel here so um I, I'll, I'll give you my first thought first okay was I started singing and we like sheep have been led astray. Ah, ah there you go. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I go right into the Messiah, you know. Right, so. right, right, right. But um, you know, the the site uh, Jesus they didn't know where his authority came from. And he, he you know, he wasn't brought up in this you know, as a Pharisee or a Sadducee or and he was questioning their authority. He was you know, he was <laughs> And and that was um, very discomforting to them. Yes, yes. And again, think of what I said at the outset. This is that period of time in the narrative leading up to his ultimate undoing. So he is in this period of time, just what you said, questioning their authority, questioning their leadership yeah and questioning especially. you know whether they are legitimately leading god's people in the right direction and we we refer back thank you george for 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 focusing on ezekiel because that's one of the things ezekiel's prophecies do you know uh he ezekiel's one of the ones who says i will Take my law and I will write it on their hearts. You know, that's one of one of the one of the most important parts of Ezekiel's prophecy. We read that portion in uh, at the Easter vigil. 
you know, that I will take my law and I will write it on their hearts, that the notion of the law being something that is more than simply external observance, but is something about internal value about a set of values that are written on the heart. And if they're written on the heart, that it is that which then determines what happens. Remember that a little bit ago, we Jesus was talking about what makes someone impure. It isn't what is on the outside. In other words, what you... What, what comes into the person, but rather what comes out of the person. And so it's this notion of what is in the heart that is what's important to God. So I'm going to, we're going to go, I'm going to share the screen and I'm going to go back. And I said a little bit that I was a little selfish to go back and I want to go back to the epistle. Now, the epistle lessons during the, the cycles of the lecture are not necessarily related to the other readings, but in this case, it just happens to fit nicely, nestled right in there. So I, and this is one of my favorite of all passages and all of scripture. And you've heard me almost recite it by heart in so many different contexts. So we're going to look at it. I can't pass it up. From Philippians 2. If there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, then make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, regard others as better than yourselves. And here we go. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not e deem equality with God something to be exploited, but emptied it himself and taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This God, Go ahead. Go God, ahead. God chose the right guy when he took Paul and converted <laughs> him. <laughs> and he, Paul did the right thing when he said he spent 19 years studying before he decided to speak. Because when he speaks, it's so profound. Um, and without him, we wouldn't be here. Yeah. And because his was the great understanding, in my opinion. As much as he adored Peter, Peter was a common man, uneducated, incapable of dealing in world uh, dimensions. Right. Right. Uh, he was a, a, a Jew, a good Jew, and he could relate to Jews. But Paul was a man of the world. And he uh, studied until he was up to the task. But he comes out with these things that are so profound in their understanding. 
that it's it's no surprise then that these letters lasted for thousands of years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I and mean, this alone, to me, encapsulates the whole of Jesus' ministry. Yes, yes. You know, that, that Jesus came. And so, just as you said, you know, when we read the gospel lesson, Jesus had been had them but again he had them but he didn't have them he didn't do it for his own pleasure he did it because he had a larger mission and this leads us to this question of authority again where is jesus authority come from the word authority in this passage that we studied is exousia. Now, the word exousia, authority in Greek, <clears throat> interestingly enough, when it's that word, ousia is the word for substance. So exousia means when we when when we use that word for authority, it means it's coming out of the very substance of something. So when you're talking about authority in that term, it's not a, a bit of like, you know, somebody gave me a mandate to do something, but whether, you know, we're talking about, it's coming out of the very substance of who Jesus is. So when, when we say, on whose authority are you doing this? This notion of, <clears throat> this ancient notion of authority is basically, we could ask the question, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? And again, remember, this isn't, this isn't a democratic society as we conceive of democracy. This is a society of, you know, of divine, you know, of monarchy and, you know, the, the, this kind of thing. So it's about this notion that you are, um, it comes out of this notion, the, uh, you know, it's an Aristotelian, uh, yeah, it's an Aristotelian notion, it's usia, this notion of substance. So it is, you know, like we, we say it sometimes we have a phrase. He's a person or she's a person of substance. You know, when we say that, what do we mean by that? We mean, you know, there's something to them. You know, they're not a fly-by-night. They're not just, you know, ephemeral. That there is, or we say somebody ha has weight. They don't mean, we don't mean they're fat, <laughs> like me. What we mean is that they have, or the word we sometimes appropriate is gravitas. They have gravity. Well, oh, what does that mean? They, they're weighty. They, there's this notion that they're going to make a difference because there's a presence to them. You know, again, all of the, it's almost metaphorical. You know, that when someone is, or they say they fill the room, we use these images. And, and so when we talk about authority in this context, this is what the argument is. They're saying, on whose authority are you doing this? And so Jesus, very rightly, as you say, George, he turns the argument on them. He said, John did this, and you failed, and they recognized John's authority. They knew, excuse my language, damn well that John had authority. And and they didn't follow it. They knew they didn't follow it. And then and then they realized that they were between a rock and a hard place because if they didn't follow him because of his religious authority, Jesus had them. And if they didn't follow them because of his popular authority, they were going to suffer. <laughs> you know, the people were going to turn on them. And they would lose their capacity to command the people. So they go like, who? Oh. 
they become mugwumps with a mug on one side of the fence and their wump on the other. <laughs> you know, you know, what better place to be, you know, when you just don't want to take a position. The ultimate politician in that sense. If the wind blows west, you turn west. The wind blows right, you turn right. <clears throat> they didn't know where the wind was coming from, so they just didn't go anywhere. And so Jesus rightly then says, well, neither will I tell you where I get my authority from. And so that only further undercuts their authority in the spirit of what the prophet Ezekiel is talking about. Couldn't enrage them more and, and threaten them more uh, in, uh, in doing that so that he was setting his own fate and knowing that. Yes. Uh, uh, and uh, well, at any rate, uh, we we find an awful lot of that going on today. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely, right? To, you know, we we have a phrase speaking truth to power. Yeah, uh, that's a very difficult thing to do, and we it's the one thing that we don't like doing because it can have very negative consequences as it did for Jesus. Yeah. But, and that's why Paul's use of this hymn in his letter, it's thought to be a, a, an ancient Christian hymn, but the humility of Christ. And, and that's where the notion of humility, you know, sometimes we, we use the phrase humility to mean sort of self-denigration. It doesn't mean that at all. Hum Christian humility, the virtue of humility in, 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 in Christian spirituality means accepting one's self for who the self truly is. And so when Paul uses this in this way, he does that. He, he, he says basically that he, Jesus recognizes himself in the end to be the equal of God. But he, humility is such that he does not exploit that. But rather uses it in service of a higher purpose. So that it is not self-oriented, but other-oriented. And that that is the very formula that we understand to be the very core of Paul's ultimate understanding of the mission of Jesus, and that is love. Which, when we go to 1 Corinthians in the 13th chapter, we see this notion of agape, of total self-giving love which is not self reverent self-referential not reverential but not self-referential at all but it is a total gift of self to the other and that that was jesus highest value and so that's what's articulated in the second part of that hymn so by being found in human form, he humbled himself and obediently, even to the point of death, even death on the cross. And for that reason, God raised him up. Because he was willing to give up everything of his self unto God for God's purposes. And because of that, God accepted that as the ultimate gift, returning to God what God had given to Jesus. So it is this ultimate, you know, God gave them, gave Jesus something, and Jesus returned it all back to God. 
And so what does God do? God gives it all back to Jesus. And so there's this dialogue of love back and forth, of total self-giving. <clears throat> God gives it to Jesus. Jesus gives it all back to God. God, in turn, the Father, gives it all back to Jesus. And so what, what's set up in, in Greek theology is, uh, Kathy, you're going to, here's this, here's this fancy schmancy word. There, therein is established the great perichoresis, the great divine dance of love that generates this power we call the great spirit, the Holy Spirit. And that's what then eventually just generates us. So <laughs> our, our aim, our purpose in life is to approach that as closely as we can. So uh, the journey of our life is this approaching asymptotically. There's a fancy word, you know, at clo as close. We never can get there until the to be um, existentialist for a moment. We can't get there until the moment of our death. It's as close as we can get till the final moment. We draw our final breath and we finally say. I am yours. And we give it back to God. But Jesus is not really in a position to say it like that. Right. He could live it like that. Yes. He, he could uh, be the example of it. But it, it, takes, it took Paul to put it in words. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that is why he was so important. Yes, with his with his understanding, and pushing that over and over again. Yeah. And and in fact, none of us can say it. Yeah, because when it happens, we're gone. Yeah, it, because it's the gospel writers who say. On the cross, you know, when we meditate on the seven last words, for example, it is finished. Or, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. It is the giving over. And that is in that instant of giving ourselves over into the divine spirit, that we are no longer present in this incarnational reality we it so it always is a post factum always an after the fact statement and so that's one reason in the christian church our funeral liturgies are so terribly important because it's the moment when we reflect on the giving over of one's life into the Father's hands of a Christian soul. We have to think, we have to articulate that for one another in a way that the person who just did that cannot for themselves. It's a witness that we give for the person who died. So when we say funerals are for the living, yes, they are. But they're not merely expressions or, or ways of, of articulating grief. They also are ways of speaking, and that's why we do all souls things. And stuff. They're, they're ways of speaking for the dead. That we are allowing them to speak this truth. That now I have given myself over into... You know, I have given, you know, Father, I give, I, you know, I commend myself to your spirit, you know, that, that reality. And that's why I think sometimes when, you know, we, we over, we accept the secularization of, of death and we sanitize it of its reality. And we fail to observe it in its Christian power. That we fail then to recognize its capacity 
to speak of this great act of love. Pretty fundamental stuff. Mm. And uh, takes a while to absorb it mm. uh, and to fit it in to your own life. Or maybe recognizing that you had seen it and didn't know it. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah. it's a sort of a thing. Um, that experience uh, has to be part of it. You have to live it right. Uh, right. And, and understand it. And often it comes too late. Well, but also I think that's the importance of the interpretive importance of um, the difference between, for example, A, a homily or a sermon in a service of Christian burial <coughs> or funeral rite and a eulogy. Because a eulogy, uh, you know, again, classically a eulogy oratorically are good words about the dead. You know, that's what the word eulogy means. It's good words. So you want to honor the dead by the, you know, speaking good words of them, you know, and, and lots of times there's lots of humor around it and all that sort of thing because you're trying to make people feel a little bit better in a very sort of difficult emotional state. But the core of it should be as much as possible to show how the person's life tracked along this path of growth in this, toward this ultimate goal as a Christian, this ultimate goal of the agopic love of Christ, this this total self-giving. In other words, how does did my life, and when I die, how did my life track along this path that is laid out in Paul by Paul in this wonderful hymn? That I, you know, that that my life increasingly imaged that of the Christ, that my authority, my substance was increasingly like that of Jesus. This is, I think, one of the, and to, to step back from it a little bit, this is one of the issues related to authority of preachers, that people can read a preacher when they are preaching with authority. See, this, this, this word is used in another place. Early on in Jesus' ministry, um, I think it's in Luke's gospel, actually, you know, as you know, they go, where did he come from? We know his relatives, you know, he's just, like, isn't he the carpenter? Where does he get such authority? The word exousia is used there, and it's, you know, how, how did he come up with this stuff? You know, it's this notion that um, he, it's coming out of his soul. And he is impressing people so. Because it's, as again, we, we've said it before, as Augustine says it, articulates it so well, heart speaking unto heart. And this is the great sin within the modern church often when you have great preachers who are great orators and they may wow congregations and you know you know groups of people and then suddenly some horrible things come out about them you know and it questions whether they were truly preaching from their soul from their heart or I mean, there's no question about, oh, we're all sinners and we all fall short of the glory of God. There's no question about that. And anybody who idolizes a preacher, is, you know, th th there's always that problem. But 
when someone is seen to be inauthentic in their preaching, that suddenly, you know, when the great scandals break. Yeah. So there's a difference between intellect yeah. and heart. And exactly. a person with great intellect and skill can can wow you uh, in their logic, but maybe in their character, there's something else that's not there. Correct. Right. That's a lacking in authority. You know, so that the authority doesn't come from what's pasted up on the wall. You know, the degrees, the yeah. you know, the certificate. Frozen. It comes from deep within. <laughs> We've frozen him in time. Yes. Oh. No, you're moving again. Okay. So it's not up what's up on the wall that gives you the authority. It, I mean, that helps you. That's the intellectual part. But the true authority comes from the heart, which when, you know, Kathy, <clears throat> Kathy understands this piece a bit. You know, that's why the question of formation for ministry becomes so, so critical, because it's not just studying the books. It's about how you integrate those things. And but it's the person who deceives the person who deceives himself mm. when he believes that that authority came from all those books he read right, right. and all those people he knew. Uh, and all the things he did, uh, when in fact it isn't coming from his heart. Uh, case in point, in the Church of England right now, there's a big scandal. You know, um, part of the renewal movement in the Church of England is called Fresh Expressions. And there are all these big, what we might call big box churches that are part of the Church of England. And there's this a priest, his name is Valachi, and he, he is... Uh, right now been the subject of a great scandal and suddenly this big move part of the movement the fresh expressions movement that he was at the core of is suddenly being questioned by many many people because he suddenly is being you know hauled over the coals because there have been accusations made and now it looks like they're credible accusations so he's been removed from active ministry and, you know, it's hitting the papers and all of this kind of thing. And so, you know, we've seen it ourselves in a different context here in the United States. How many times, um, you know, with, you know, the, you know, some of the big evangelical preachers and so on. And yet you have the others, for example, who have long, long historical ministries like Billy Graham, you know, who were authentic people who, who you know, lived and worked and died without that and have great legacies of yeah. tremendous work behind them. I think of Jimmy Carter, ah, who will yeah. be 99 coming up. Yeah. Uh, and where his life was an example that only got better and better with age. And there was never a scandal connected with him. Um, and uh, an amazing life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting how, you know, even today, you know, given the current headlines and so on, how there are people who will not admit that there might be leaders who are not scandal ridden. Yeah. That it can't be true. There must be something there, even though when there's nothing there, you know. Power corrupts. You know, and that and that there could be someone like a Jimmy Carter whose center is not in power, is not in, you know, money or any of the things that corrupt, but rather is in something like his faith in Jesus Christ yeah. and has 
all of the gifts, you know, the armor of faith that Paul talks about in Ephesians, and in fact is able to repel, quote unquote, the act, the you know, the attacks of the devil or the attacks of the enemy, and is able to live that kind of life. But as you just said, when you see his life and it got better and better and better and better, this is a life that tracks, just what I was saying before, the metaphor that tracks the life of Jesus in this notion of continual growth in this agopic yep. love of self-giving. Yeah. And that in fact, um, there are, are people who cannot believe that anyone who was at the center of power for any given point in time, and everybody thinks he was a terrible president and all that kind of stuff, because Probably because he refused to do the things. Yeah. yeah. He was stubborn. <laughs> you know, that people said he should have done in order to, quote unquote, retain power and all that sort of thing, that he was going to do it, quote unquote, the right way, but it wasn't the way of the world. Yeah. And so it wasn't the, the sexy, the fancy, the, you know, the, the corrupt way. It was too vanilla, too plain. You know, the plain man from Plains, Georgia, the peanut <laughs> farmer, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, Abe Lincoln was like that. You know, that, that was part of the, people didn't like him either. I was just, just reading, interesting, I was just given today's gospel lesson that we're studying. There's, there's an article in the U.S. Catholic, which is sort of a progressive side of Catholicism, um, the, the, I haven't read the article yet, but um, the title of the article, the headline is, People Didn't Like Jesus Either. <laughs> <laughs> but that could be the headline of, of, of today's gospel lesson. Because Jesus preached a gospel that made a lot of people uncomfortable, particularly the leadership of Jesus' day. But also many of the people who were of the same mindset of the leadership, because he was calling into question the framework around which their religious convictions were built. Do this, do this, do this, do this, you'll get in. <laughs> and he's saying, no. That it's, you know, you must care for the poor. You must do you know you must have the law you know going back to ezekiel you must have the law of god written within your heart and act out of that when he answers the question who is my neighbor and he tells the parable of the good samaritan <clears throat> oh my god the samaritans are supposed to be our models who would think of that you know he talks to women oh my lord and a Samaritan woman at that, at the well, even his disciples were saying, why are you talking to her? You know, it was, you know, it was, he was breaking a lot of stereotypes, moving people out of their comfort zone. <laughs> Preachers who do that are not very popular. And I have to say, We've lost a couple of parishioners recently because of that. And we're not going backwards. You know, it, as, as it has been said, the gospel is there to comfort the afflicted. And afflict the comfortable. And afflict the comfortable. <laughs> it's but, not... Know, go ahead, Kenny. Okay. But while you're talking about all of that, at the same time, he gave uh, hope to the masses. You know, the mass of people who were the poor, the majority of people who were the poor people. He lifted them up. He gave them their first hope that they had value. Yes. Which yes. no one had really done before that. Right. Which makes the people in the upper echelons and the sort of middle echelons, if you want to use class, classic yeah. classes, 
very uncomfortable. Yeah, he scared because the Jesus out of them. Yeah, it <laughs> it threatens their position. Yeah, because if you have a transactional view of society, if they gain, I lose. And see, and that's why you hear me when I'm preaching about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not transactional because God is a God of abundance. There's always more. There's not a finite amount of grace. There's not a finite amount of love. There's always more. But see, when we see God as transactional, if God gives this person something, it means I have less. Because that means that my view, worldview is there's only a finite amount of things. Therefore, if that person gets something, it's got to come from somewhere else. And it damn well is not coming from me. It's hard um, to comprehend infinity. Yeah. I'm I'm reminded of something that happened to Betty and me. Um while I was on the faculty, I became uh, very friendly with a, a fellow faculty member who, who had come here from Serbia. And I had operated on his son, and um, they they uh, invited us to dinner, and then invited us to the Serbian uh, celebration uh, of Saint Nicholas, their patron saint, and it was a uh, fascinating. They they had a small pig had been roasted and we had the entire pig there and we were cut meat off of it. Uh, we had Schlibowitz, uh, which is like drinking uh, paint remover. And, uh, <laughs> I've had it, yes, I know. <laughs> and it was a really a, a delightful event. The following year, they invited us again to their house for the Feast of St. Nicholas. But in the meantime, Serbia was in a, what Milosevic described as ethnic cleansing <clears throat> and perfectly horrible things were happening to the Muslim community and particularly to the young women. It, it was atrocious. And so when and he was, this man was really a, a, a nice guy and everything. And we're there and and I said, oh, isn't it, you know, I, I can't get over the, the suffering and happening in Serbia and the, the atrocities that are happening uh, to these young Muslims. And he said, George, they breed like rats. You got to get rid of them. Wow. I couldn't believe my ears. Right. I said, You approve of that? Well, that's what we have to do. And uh, Betty and I picked up our coats and walked out. Yeah. And I never talked to him again. Yeah. Yeah. This was a decent, civilized guy who. I had no dream that uh, he could be of that kind. And and this was a, a Christian celebration. Mm -hmm. The whole thing was turned upside down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and see, this is, th this is part of larger questions that we, we contend with. I mean, even among Christians themselves. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, you're talking about sort of what's considered the quote-unquote orthodox, big O, orthodox family of Christians. 
And sometimes between the West and the East, you know, there have been these kinds of things, um, you know, Catholics and Orthodox. The, fa the fact that you were a quote unquote Protestant or, you know, a, a Anglican sometimes, well, the Orthodox and Anglicans tend to get along a bit more. But if you were Catholic, you know, that they're considered heretics. And there was there was a time when Catholics and Orthodox, you could not even talk to each other. Um, there, you know, there have been these kinds of things that have often in history and, and historical roots for those kinds of things sometimes are, again, baked in in ways that are need deep, deep conversion. And that deep conversion takes a great deal of time. And the reconciliation work that has to go on, I, know, I go back and I, I know, actually, it's interesting because since I recommended the book, I've heard a lot of criticism of Justin Welby's book on reconciliation. Um, he's gotten a lot of personal criticism um, for a number of different reasons. Um, that First of all, that he's naive about things. And even some of his personal actions since the book has come out. Um, but I still think some of his insights are valid because I think he does have insight into something like that. That these these rivalries, these these histories go back go back generations. It's like the the Palestinian Israeli issue. It's not as solvable as everybody thinks it is. You know, again, Americans in particular, our, our history is junior to speak, I guess. I don't know quite what the word I want to use. Our historical rivalries, you know, over 200, less than 250 years are nothing compared to rivalries that go back thousands of years and have been baked in almost to the point where they might you might even say that they're genetic <laughs> um and there's some there's some theorists who say that social theorists that say actually there is something to that that there is actually um you know that the, between depth psychology and um social patterns and so on, that there is actually something to that because of the, you know, intermarriage and people who do not move around, you know, we're very mobile and, you know, we're a very um, homogeneous or a heterogeneous society, I should say, that, you know, we do not enter, um, we just, uh, on a lark, Ken was home to Harrisburg for, for two days um, and we watched uh, my big fat Greek wedding too, you know, and, and you know that whole thing about everything Greek, 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 Greek. You know, every word has got a Greek origin and all this kind of stuff. You know, Michael Constantine, you know, being the grandpa, he's since gone to God. The actor has, and so on. So you know, but that whole idea of you know, you only marry your own. It's as recent as my parents' generation. I mean, my my mother's father was very upset with my mother because she had the temerity to try to date an Italian boy, you know, not, you know, from across the Erie Canal. There was, you know, in our hometown, little town of 5,000 people, we had little ethnic ghettos, you know, <laughs> south of the canal was where the Italians lived. We lived north of the canal. We had our own parish, you know, um, and the Italians who worked the quarries on the canal for generations they live south of the canal, but the Polish work, you know, they, they live north of the canal. Why do you, you know, and he used some rather pejorative terms. I never knew my grandfather. He died before I was born, but my mom would tell the stories. You know, why do you want to date, go out with that? And he would use a pejorative term, uh, you know, for an Italian, uh, you know, and refused her permission to date this person. Now she's an adult. She's not like even high, she's out of high school, you know, 
and it was just not done. So she ended up marrying my father, who was Polish. You know, so it's like, <laughs> you know, and she, there was j joking about, you know, a joking resentment about having to marry my father. You know, so there was all of this kind of thing going on. But the idea that, you know, those things even persisted into our own culture until the 1950s. You know, they were married in 1950. So only recently, within the last 50 years, one generation, really, um, maybe two now, that, you know, we've sort of broken out of some of that, but still some of that endures among more recent ethnic um, immigrate, Im immigrants, uh, Latino immigrants, uh, uh, South Asian immigrants, uh, Far Eastern immigrants, and so on, that you know, you have to marry within your own clans and so on, that this worldwide global societies, um, you know, that our American way of looking at things, our, our heterogeneous cultures and so on, are not the normative way that the world looks at things. So we too often have a rather glib approach to these things. And when we talk about world conflicts, like the conflict in Ukraine currently, you know, there's a lot of that is ethnic. Um, you know, that's, you know, Putin's uh, claim that there, there really is no such thing as a Ukrainian. You know, they're really Russians. Um, and, and there's some merit to that. But if he actually, when you really look at it, those who inhabit Ukraine are actually more ancient ethno-Russians than the people in Russia themselves. So it would be the opposite <laughs> that he's trying to claim. So, but, you know, the whole idea is kind of wacky. But anyway, the, the notion that, uh, you know, there are easy solutions to these things are, is not viable. But the thing about Jesus is that the kingdom values, now there's a long way of getting to this, that the kingdom <laughs> values supersede that. That what when we look at us ourselves as children of God, that the fundamental identity is as an icon of the divine presence, and that our ethno-national, linguistic differences, all that kind of stuff, are merely facets of the of God. That they're all included in the Godhead. And that none of it, I mean, and so, you know, thought experiment, bing, bing, bing. What if we find extraterrestrial beings? You know, talk about, we even call them aliens, you know. We talk about aliens to our nation. Can you imagine that? Aliens to our human race. Are they part of the Godhead as well? You know, if we believe that our God created the universe, where do they find a place in our theology relative to the image of God? You know, and <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, that'll blow your mind. Uh, and so... <laughs> You know, did, did Jesus redeem them? Um, did they need redemption? <laughs> you know, all this kind of stuff. Has something similar happened to them on their planet? Ah. Was there How do they explain everything? Yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So that when we get into this whole question, you know, and, and even that, could, George, you know, is a question... You know, the Judeo-Christian explanation of the world and its origins and so on, you know, we're very hegemonic about that. You know, our mythic origins of the universe, you know, in Genesis and so on, we forget that there are large uh, ancient cultures in China and Japan and other parts of the, you know, the Mayan cultures, the indigenous cultures and how they explain how the world came to be and so on, that they're not necessarily inconsistent with our mythic understandings, but they use different language and different imagery and different, you know, mythic stories 
that, I mean, that the, the work of Joseph Campbell to me is mind blowing about that. Um, you know, his his story or his seminal work, The Hero Has a Thousand Faces, is just, you know, and the depth psychology of Carl Jung. I really got into that when I was in seminary. I mean, that's what my master's thesis is about that. But, you know, that's it's that idea that all of this is like baked into our psyches, you know, and and is part of what God instilled deep within us as human beings, not as Western, you know, Judeo-Christian civilization. Um, is something we all need to get our minds wrapped around. And Lord knows if you went down to Washington and you tried to say any of this to a certain portion of the Capitol, um, they'd say, "Where on whose authority are you saying this? <laughs> yeah. And you'd be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, on Sunday, when we hear these words, you know, on whose authority do you say this? Think of what is the substantive element, you know, that where is Jesus speaking from? Where is this coming? You know, several weeks ago, Jesus asked the question, who do you say that I am? Is related to this question. The substance of Jesus. And so that even Paul today in the in the epistle where we will, we will read, Jesus did not deem equality with God something to be exploited. And I love the I love the, a different translation that says something to be grasped at. He didn't hold on to it, but rather gave it away freely. so that we could receive it as well. And that's what the gift that he's giving to us. Any final thoughts? Excellent discussion. Pretty contemporary. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> I think we're living it. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, the, the Bible's as contemporary as it ever was, you yeah. know, and it, even Ezekiel, like you said, so many thousands oh, of years ago, yes. that there it is right in front of us. I guess yeah. it tells us some things never change. Precisely so. Well, it's, it's about who we are as human beings. Yeah. 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 All right. So good. We'll see you again next week. Take care. Invite a friend. <laughs> <laughs> You too. Oh, thank you, Father. <laughs> Take care, all. We'll see you Sunday. Yeah. Bye-bye.